We're in business. All right. So the hard road nominalist about scientific applications. Now I just realized I went. Yeah. The hard road nominalist about scientific applications tries to eliminate quantification over abstracta from our Platonistic scientific theories. Um, so we've got the Platonistic theory, it becomes the nominalistic theory N, and defends the use of mathematical theory N in science by appeal to its conservativeness over the nominalistic theory. The easy road nominalist about scientific applications just leaves the scientific theories in their original Platonistic form, but they add or insist uh, or insinuate that properly understood the quantification over abstracta, which is left in place, uh, is non-committal, so it shouldn't bother the nominalist. So prima facie problem, which is really only dealt with later by, by uh, Hart, Hartree in some amazing papers, the hardware nominalist relies on metallurgical knowledge, e.g. that the mathematical theory is consistent or that it's conservative over the nominalistic theory, and this looks like an application of pure mathematical knowledge to logical questions. Um, so the hard road nominalist has some explaining to do. And the same two options appear to present themselves. Um, so let's talk about easy versus hard road and metalogic. Um, hard road nominalist about metalogical applications would try to rewrite metalogical theories nominalistically. Maybe that's in the, in the spirit of Quine and Goodman, steps towards a constructive nominalism. Maybe, you know, you'd look at proof tokens instead of proofs conceived as abstract objects. An easy, yeah, def and defend the use of models, proofs, I guess, by, by claiming conservativeness over some kind of nominalized metalogic. An easy road nominalist about metalogical applications would keep on quantifying over models and proofs, insisting that properly understood, that's non-committal. Our hero, Hartree, our leader, is a hard roader re-science. Re He's more of an easy roader when it comes to metalogic. Metalogical knowledge, when properly rendered, turns out to be non-committal. Better than or worse than non-committal, it turns out, in fact, to be just logical knowledge. You might think that sounds crazy. Metalogical knowledge is, is logical. And here I'm just retracing some of the route that, that, that Hartree uh, takes in, in a couple of fascinating uh, papers, main one being is mathematical knowledge, just logical knowledge. So look, metalogic concerns sentences and their logical properties. Logical knowledge is supposed to be of logical truths. Logical truths, almost by definition, are like about sentences. Um, so to all appearances then, as Harkery says himself, the knowledge that certain mathematical claims follow from or don't follow from certain others is not knowledge of logical tr truths. Metalogic, moreover, quantifies over abstracta. P implies Q if there is a proof of Q from P, but not if there is a model of P that falsifies Q. Um, well, this is very Platonistic way of talking. So the project runs, so it seems into a perfect metallurgical storm and attempts to calm this storm are made in these two papers, mathematical knowledge, just logical knowledge and metallurgic and modality. And there's some other related papers. Oops. Yeah. Um, all right. So some of this is from Hartree and some of it I've just sort of added on using some notions that he might or might not like, but he said, he definitely says the following, look, independently of any other issues, we can see that P implies Q is not how to render metallurgical information. For one thing, it makes metallurgical information metalinguistic. It makes it about sentences. And I'm adding a bit of stuff here, but it may not, it may be found welcome or unwelcome. It makes it contingent and it makes it empirical, which mental logic was not supposed to be. So here's a quote from Hartree. Doesn't the metal linguistic fact that one sentence follows from another depend on the fact that certain words appearing in these sentences are used as logical words by speakers of the language in question? If so, knowledge of what follows from what has the contingent element that the mathematical knowledge 
in this case, metallurgical mathematical knowledge we were trying to convey presumably lacks. But Hartree points out there is a way around this problem. Rather than saying that the metallurgician knows de re a of a sentence Q falls from another sentence P or of a theory T that it's consistent, we'll say that she knows de dicto that necessarily if P then Q or that uh, it's possible that that the inappropriate understanding which uh, of these two modal operators, which hopefully I won't, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but it's sort of important that these express purely logical modalities and it's something to do with sort of there being a classical, you know, diamond is there is a classical model of the sentence and necessarily as all classical models of the one are, are classical, well, all class, classical models of P or classical models of Q. So the truths here are not metalinguistic. T is used, not mentioned in diamond T for the same reason as T is used and not mentioned in not T, or it's not the case that T. Um, the truths here are not contingent. Diamond T, that T is consistent, holds necessarily. I added a footnote Necessarily, in what sense? Um, you know, you might you might say, well, we should be using understanding necessity in the same way, truth in all models. But of course, it doesn't hold in all models of say piano arithmetic that that piano arithmetic is cons is consistent. There's none. That's the semantic version of the incompleteness. Theorem. I just say that to leave it aside. There will be a few of those kinds of things. Or, I mean, the truths here, diamond, diamond T, don't seem to be uh, a posteriori. Whether our theory is consistent looks like it's an a priori matter. Again, you have to add here that you're using a priori in a sense that sort of allows infinite searches through kind of a priori circumstances domains because given the undecidability of first order logic there's no there's no finite decision procedure for first order logic so the it certainly isn't empirical although yeah th this is a big a big question this is probably why Hartree's an expressivist about a priori versus a posteriori um, okay so now that so-called knowledge of p implies q has become knowledge that box P then Q is a modal paraphrase also available for regular mathematical knowledge, say that the number four has factors. And here's what Harkery says, the fictionalist believes that two times two equals four only in the sense that she believes that standard mathematics says that or has as a consequence that two times two is four. Just as most of us believe that Oliver Twist lived in London, only in the sense that, etc. So importantly here, the idea is not that standard mathematics implies R, gives the content of R. That's the view that Hartree calls deductivism or if thenism, and he rejects that view. His view is what sets so-called R knowers apart is that they know that standard mathematics implies R. The content is not, does not involve standard mathematics, but the knowledge is implicitly knowledge of standard mathematics. Just as you might say that knowledge that Oliver Twist li lived in London is really knowledge that according to the stories he lived in London. So the analogy with metallurgical knowledge here is not perfect because you might think P implies Q is already modal. You know, you might think there's something modal about the idea of implication. It's controversial. Um, but two times two equals four is not already modal on the face of it. The idea that standard mathematics implies R, sorry, uh, yeah, implies R, departs from R in other ways too. So I want to revisit these notions of aboutness and contingency and a posteriority that standard mathematics implies R seems, unlike R, to be about standard mathematics, just as according to the 
Dickens novel, All of Which Twists Lived in London, seems like it's a little bit about the Dickens novel. One might worry that it's also a contingent claim since what I've written as SM is really a definite description standing for whatever math is actually sort of taken for granted or is relevant to the evaluation of R. Well, different math might have been standard. And so there's an element of contingency. And you might also think that there's something empirical here because it takes experience to realize that this math is standard as opposed to that math. But these worries are eased if we do what Hartree does, which is we read SM implies R as necessarily, this is again logical necessity, AX then R, where AX is just the conjoined standard axioms for the relevant branch of math. So yeah, he, Hartree is, is careful to limit himself in relevant context to finitely axiomatizable theories. So, so he, I, I'm not so careful. So I, I, I just realized, so I, I, I have something like the axioms of piano arithmetic. Well, of course it isn't a finitely axiomatized theory. It has a schema. Um, but that's not going to be the issue. So um, let's suppose that we read, instead of SM implies R, we'll, we'll read the thing that you have to know to count as knowing that R in practice as box axioms then R. So, so here's a couple of new worries that, 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 that might arise that are going to set up a proposal later in the, in the paper. Um, obvious one is knowledge that two times two equals four long predated knowledge that necessarily the axioms of arithmetic then two times two is, is four, I, I believe. Um, everybody knows that two times two is four, very few know or even understand the modalized claim about the axioms. Knowledge that two times two is four is not defeated by findings about the axiom. So if it turns out that the Italian logicians who think that piano arithmetic is inconsistent are correct, uh, we don't say, oh, well, too bad for two times two is four. Or I guess the right thing would be to say, uh, so much the better for two times two equals five, because everything would, would follow from the axioms. And then there's a question about, this is a standard point, Knowledge of an axiom doesn't seem like it's just knowing that that axiom is one of the axioms. So, but it would seem on this view that like, so take it, the axiom that numbers with the same successor are identical. It seems like my knowledge of that fact does not just reduce to the fact that it's one of the axioms of piano arithmetic. The axioms of piano arithmetic are, are evaluated in light of the prior understanding that that's how numbers behave, you might think. Uh, Ill-definedness is the, the fifth possible problem. A related problem for the view that knowing R comes to knowing necessarily axioms then R is raised by Hartree himself against if thenism, which again is not his own view. The implausibility of ephenism is evident in a case of a mathematical assertion R made in the absence of a generally accepted axiomatization. The if thenist must select some one body of other mathematical statements and claim that what is meant in saying R is really that R follows from this other body of statements. Uh, but the knowledge reductionist, which is what I'm calling Hartree's view of this matter, cannot say which conditional has to be known to count as knowing that R any more than the if thenist can say which conditional gives R's real content. Now this could be, and in some settings it probably is, a plus for knowledge reductionism. As Hartree says, lots of bodies of assertions are relative to what the mathematician who asserted R knows, since a great many distinct pieces of knowledge of the interrelation of R with other mathematical claims may have been part of the motivation for asserting R. And that's certainly true for interesting, sophisticated mathematical assertions. But you might think it's different for, for two times two equals four. One might think, Charles Parsons makes a lot of this, that to know two times two is four is to know a definite intuitively obvious thing by reference to which other mathematical assertions like maybe the axioms of P 
piano arithmetic are evaluated rather than conversely. Russell uh, makes this point quite a bit. Um, okay, an intriguing further point that Harkree makes against if thenism is to do with assertions that we sometimes make of none theorems, say a proposed new axiom. So Penn, Penelope Manny, may say that there have got to be inaccessible cardinals aware that ZFC doesn't prove this. You know, inaccessible cardinals are, yeah, they, they pretty much have got to be. Um, um, and Hargree makes the following comment. If one takes deductivism literally, she must mean either that the new axiom follows from the old axioms, which clearly doesn't, or that the new axiom follows from the system that consists of the old axioms plus the new axiom, but doesn't believe the first thing, and the second is totally trivial. Or again, Penn may say that ZFC is consistent, aware too that this is unprovable in ZFC by the second to completeness theorem. Knowledge deductivism seems to escape this worry by targeting not content, but knowledge. This is, Hardy says, the kind of knowledge that typically leads a mathematician to assert a new axiom is clear enough. It's knowledge that the axiom in conjunction with previously accepted axioms has certain desirable consequences and doesn't seem to have undesirable ones. But while this might be true for certain, like large cardinal axioms, say, it might be uh, advanced in this spirit, the consistency of ZFC is rarely advanced in this spirit. Um, for one reason, it just leaves us back with the same problem as before, is ZFC plus con ZFC consistent? That's given essential incompleteness. That's going to be a further question. Attempts to sort of carry this program all the way through uh, by adding consistency claims or more generally reflection uh, claims were made by Solomon Pfefferman in the 60s and it works out beautifully but you have to get into a lot of complicated stuff about recursive ordinals and how it, 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 it's 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 not something that mathematicians actually propose doing. You know, con ZFC is accepted on inductive grounds, or maybe on Gudillian uh, intellectual vision grounds. We can sort of see that ZFC is true to the cumulative hierarchy, and we kind of imagine we have some sense of what the cumulative hierarchy lo looks like. As, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll skip this part about incompleteness because it's too tucky and I didn't get anywhere. So there's this invidious distinction, physics versus metalogic. Why can we take the easy road in metalogic or an easier road in metalogic, but not physics? The explanation given in my book for the legitimate usability of Platonistic physics turns on the existence of a nominalistic physics. But the explanation I have just given for the legitimate usability of Platonistic proof theory does not require the existence of a nominalistic proof theory. I think other people have sort of observed this uh, earlier in Hartree made, made, made a remark to this effect. What accounts for the difference? So to make our peace with physical applications of Platonistic math, we have to drastically rewrite the underlying physics. When it comes to Platonistic metalogic, one has only to take the existential antecedents in, and I'm here just sort of quoting from bits of, of Hartree's paper on metalogic. If there's a model for the sentence A, then possibly A. If there's a proof of not A, then not possibly A. And you condition them on set theory. So MTP sharp is if necessarily given he uses NBG because it's a finitely axiomatized set theory. If NBG, then there's a model for A, then it's possible that A. If, again, this basically means it follows from NBG that there is a proof of not A, then it's not possible that A. And these tweaks are very much in the spirit of easy road nominalism. MTP sharp is kind of like possibly A if there's a model according to N NBG um, that's the von Neumann Bernays Gödel, Gödel set theory. Um, MS sharp is like not possible A if there's a disproof according to that set theory. Um, so why do the two roads differ? 
Well, here's what Hartree says. Only physics is explanatory. So here's a, I'll break this into two points. Point alpha, one should not junk a Platonistic explanation of a phenomenon unless there's a satisfactory Unless there's a satisfactory um, explanation of place. This is why a satisfactory nominalistic formulation of physical theories is required. And then beta, the main role of Platonistic proof theory, and I think the same, is not explanatory. We do not need a nominalistic analog of model theory because model theory doesn't explain anything. But Against the first point, it's not clear that the easy rotor is really junking any Platonistic explanations. Um, so to use my typically sort of dumbed down sort of example, um, why can't we tile the room with these tiles? Um, well, the room is like rectangular, the number of tiles is prime, it's not factorizable. Um, so Whereas when you tile a room, it's going to have m, you're going to need m times n tiles, where m is the number fitting along one dimension and n along the other dimension. The explainer here is already nominalistic for the easy rotor, because the sentence has as its nominalistic content that there are primely many tiles. And so you already have a nominalistic explanation according to the easy rotor um, in that at least one case. But also, and this is what I find interesting, but it also just leads back into the point that Mark Cullivan was making about, it's hard to make progress on any of this stuff until we know more about explanation. Why are models not explanatory? So you might think, look, a model is a would-be counterexample to the validity of an argument. So I went to the source on counterexamples in mathematics. There's, of course, these famous books, counterexamples in analysis, counterexamples in topology. Uh, counterexamples in analysis says that we use counterexamples to quote unquote show why, which I, the word why there suggests that there's something explanatory going on. Show why, for instance, continuous functions don't have to be differentiable. Uh, math Reviews says of the book Counterexamples in Topology that if you need an example to explain why sequential compactness, which I don't, I don't know what, what that is, let me just say out front, is not equivalent to compactness, this is where you can find it. So whether explanatory considerations favor one road in physics and another in metal logic could be, could be questioned. I, I have no firm view about this, but I'll just sort of paddle around in these waters for a bit. Um, so here's some replies on behalf of the invidious distinction uh, to these suggestions I've just made. So the se second suggestion was models are too explanatory. Look at what they say in counterexamples uh, in analysis and in topology. Well, one answer might be, yeah, but they explain only in the psychological sense of relieving puzzlement. They might, they might remind us of why, you know, Q doesn't follow from P. What makes P fail to imply Q is not addressed. It's not because of the existence of a counter model that the implication uh, fails. Second, the explanatory work, and I think this is a really deep point that, that Hartree uh, makes in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the metallurgical stuff. The explanatory work, if any, is done by the possibility of the counter model. Whether the counter model truly exists seems like it's be beside the point. If God came down and said, oh, you know, I forgot to make that counter model, but I really could have, and it makes perfect intuitive sense, that would be enough for us to see why the, 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 the argument was invalid. Then the second point was, look, um, numbers are mere representational aids and if so then it's not clear that you are sacrificing nominalistic the nominalistic character of your explanations 
uh, when you use numbers in them because you're just using them to call attention to a certain nominalistic fact, which is really doing the explaining. But the, the friend of the NVIDIA distinction might say, they may be mere representational aids and the number of tiles is prime, but numbers also figure in pure mathematical explanations. And in keeping with my desire to limit myself to bits of math that I almost understand, so why is it when you roll dice a bunch of times, uh, they come up seven more often than two? It's harder to get snake eyes than to get seven. Well, it's because of the mathematical fact, seven is more ways obtainable as the sum of smaller numbers than two. Um, again, the possibility of numbers may legitimate representational uses, but the fact that I just mentioned about two versus seven can't explain physical outcomes unless it really obtains. It's not enough that it be possible. Uh, it really better be the case that seven is more ways obtainable. Okay, now here's my counter replies from Easy Street. Um, so let's agree that models are only psychologically explanatory and or that the real work is done by, it's possible that M is a counter example to uh, P therefore Q. Maybe pure mathematical explanations of physical outcomes operate along similar lines. So take A1, maybe seven is a sum more ways than two only relieves puzzlement by giving us a new line of sight on the physical Scenario. I mean, think of the way that reasoning with the Bohr model of the atom can relieve puzzlement, or to use an example that Penelope Matty uses a lot, think about the way in which reasoning with a model of the ocean according to which it's infinitely deep can relieve puzzlement about wave phenomena. Uh, compare the way the mean value theorem helps us to see why you must have been driving at some point in a certain period at your average velocity over that period, right? Uh, if the police pick you up after an hour long drive and say, look, your average velocity over this period was 90 miles an hour and it's illegal to drive 90 miles an hour. You can't say, well, I never, at no point in time was I driving at exactly 90 miles an hour. Not that that's what the law prescribed specifically because of the mean, mean value theorem. You're at some point bound to be driving at your uh, average speed over that period. Um, as for the second point, the one about, well, could a modalized version of the mathematical claim be enough? Um, well, we need to find an operator, delta, such that what really explains the dice's behavior is delta seven is a sum more ways than two. And delta will have to be non-factive. And I wanna say this might not be impossible. Generic claims are on standard views capable of being true and explanatory, even if uninstantiated. So some examples of Greg Carlson's from the generic book. Bishops move diagonally. You could even put an existential thing in there. There are four bishops. They all move diagonally, okay? Um, this example has sort of lost some of its sting, but you can imagine at a certain post office, it's a rule that Carol handles the mail from Antarctica. There is no mail from Antarctica, but Carol handles it. That's her job. An object experiencing zero net force maintains its velocity. I mentioned that one. Objects accelerating to the speed of light become arbitrarily massive. That's like, that's why there aren't any objects that accelerate or massive objects that accelerate to the speed of light. The universal set has all its subsets as members. That's, that's what it is to be a universal set. Um, that's why there isn't a universal set given Cantor's theorem. And then I, I mentioned this before, brakeless trains are dangerous. So, so how are you gonna understand a claim like bishops move diagonally? Well, it's 
intuitively understood to be about a certain kind of object, the case, chess pieces or chess pieces of a certain sort. It represents them as of a type to behave phyly, where phi is the sentence coming after delta. In this kind of case where the sentence is heard as saying what it is for a certain type of object to behave phyly, like perpetual motion machines are machines that blah, 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 you know, uh, it'll be hard to distinguish phi from the sentence that sort of it lies in the nature of k's to phi, where delta, delta k presents what follows it as holding generically of the k's. That's why it's, and Hartree says it, several points that all universally quantified mathematical statements are, are true um, on the nominalist view, but it's always been difficult even for the nominalist to hear a statement like perfect numbers are always odd as true. I use the word always there because that's one of the tests for uh, whether the sentence is being given in generic uh, reading adverbs of, of, of frequency. You don't say coins in my pocket are always copper, even if all the coins in your pocket. Um, and another reason to think there might be something like a delta operator going on in a perspicuous representation of mathematics comes from the phenomenon of mathematical coincidence. So it does seem like a, a mathematical fact that the number of platonic solids is five. It's also a mathematical fact that the third prime number is five, or, it's, or, or the, the smallest odd prime that's also a bell number, if you know what a bell number is. Uh, but it doesn't seem like a mathematical fact that you'd want to sort of trot out there as of interest that the number of platonic solids is the smallest odd prime bell number. They just happen to both be five. Um, okay, I'm almost there. Relevance to the nominalism debate. Um, well, Platonists will have to insist that the real explanatory work when you appeal to pure mathematical generalizations or facts um, is really done by the sentence phi, which might be ontologically committal if it's got existential quantifiers in it, rather than it lies in the nature of these sorts of objects to behave even that isn't ontologically committal. Is this the case? I have no idea. But this just seems like a really gripping question to me. Does the existence of numbers with such and such properties better explain why snake eyes is relatively uncommon than those properties holding generically of numbers? This is what numbers are like. The question hasn't really been studied and it's not obvious either way. Um, but this I suspect is where our efforts ought to be going. What's the difference in explanatory power between a pure mathematical statement and a statement to the effect that this is what these objects behave like. Um, so here's a propitiatory in a certain way final note, or just to acknowledge that none of this will be any use to Hardry at all, is that Hardry goes to great lengths to say he does not see modality as a panacea and his version of diamond is acceptable to him only because it's explainable on a completely non-metaphysical basis. Um, Delta, to the extent we can make sense of it at all, is not like that. So. I'm pretty sure he won't like it, um, but it does still seem to me to be a question of independent interest, what the um, explanatory potential is of phi as opposed to delta phi. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, thanks, Steve, that was awesome. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Hartree for a, a few minutes and see how useful he thinks it is. Okay, so um, um, so I'm not actually sure that I got everything here. Um, uh, uh, a main a main question is uh, a main question that you raise is um, 
if it's impossible or unsatisfactory to get a nonstick physics by just modalizing away the use of mathematical entities in allopagnostic physics, um, why is it both possible and also okay to, to get a nonstick metalogic by just modalizing away the use of uh, models and proofs in the Platonistic metalogic. And um, so I see that you, you give an answer that I gave in terms of explanatoriness. Um, when I first saw the question in your slides, I, I, that is not the answer I was inclined to give. Uh, the answer I was inclined to give is, well, there's a real obstacle to doing it in the case of uh, physics, and 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 this is the thing that, that Mary was talking about yesterday about the no interference condition, um, which um, which I I took very seriously as something that one can't just. Um, say, well, there's no interference and, and leave it at, at that. I thought you had to really say what that meant. And with using the ordinary apparatus of actuality operators, it didn't seem possible to do so without actually doing part of the, of the hard road job. Um, whereas in the case of metalogic, nothing like that happened. You don't have to um, uh, uh, um, holds, holds anything fixed. So that's the answer I, that occurred to me when you raised the question. And I, I was dismayed to see that I had given some different answer in terms of explanatoriness. Um, and um, since I don't understand what explanatoriness, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I do find it very intuitive to talk about explanatory proofs versus non-explanatory proofs, and and to talk you in uh, to talk of mathematical ag ag explanation. But I don't really know what it is that I'm saying when I say that. I I, I sort of suspect that it's just a, ma a matter of what's psychologically salient to us or, or something like that. Um, so anyway, so maybe, um, um, so, so when you talked about the delta of operator, I, I gather you're, you're assuming some some fairly heavy duty notion of explanatoriness. I mean, it seemed to me, as far as I could see, that a lot of your, uh, a, a lot of what you wanted to say about it could, 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 could just be explained in, in, in terms of uh, logical consequence. I guess in the thing about the bell numbers, uh, you had to, uh, you should say something about sort of an easily seeable uh, logical consequence or uh, something like that. Anyway, I, um, I think that I might have missed something about what you were talking about there. Um, so let's see, um, we got a couple of other things here. Um, um, I mean, one thing that may be relevant um, when you talked about things like there are primarily many tiles and and so forth, um, I mean I do think that it is a lacuna in the in the um, uh, in the book that um, that it didn't provide a way to literally say things like there are primarily many tiles. Um, um, and, and, and so in the new edition, I mean, I made some remarks about how nice it would be to uh, give a more extended theory of, of numerical quantification. 
um, but I was too lazy to actually do that. Um, um, so anyway, I don't, I don't know if that's uh, relevant to what you're uh, saying or not. Um, I guess the only other thing I ha ha had to say here, so there was something in the slides that I saw about a gap between the um, between a a a, a, a modal ag ag axiom of the form possibly a and a corresponding uh, con a claim. Um, I don't. Was that in the slides that you gave? I or? skipped that one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then uh, I won't say anything about either that. Okay. So let me leave it at that. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so super, super quickly. Yeah. So one point about diamond and one point about delta, or not point, but just thought. Um, right, so you, you said what you didn't like about the handling applications with diamond and, 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 and I take it it's because in the standard ways of doing two dimensional modal logic with indexed actuality operators, you need to, I can sort of see how you need to have a nominalistic statement of the physics to, to, to make that work out. There, 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 are, there are certain, um, the modalist program sometimes considers sentences like this, you know, uh, my car could have been faster than your car actually is. And that requires a slightly stronger resource where you have a predicate that's essentially doing trans-world comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I uh, mentioned yesterday that uh, uh, Daniel Brinson has uh, oh. shown, shown, shown me some stuff that, that um, that uh, does things like this, and and uh, and so uh, I'm not actually uh, as sure as I was back then that, that the modalist uh, 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 doesn't uh, work. I mean, I I I I guess I still think the hard road is is more explanatory when you can do it, but. Um, but I think I don't want to, at least I, I need to work through the Brinson and stuff. And the, maybe there are some other stuff that you're referring to that I shouldn't know about too. Um, uh, 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 but I think I uh, might have to withdraw some of my strong claims from the 80s about the hopelessness of the, of the modalist program. The other thing is the Delta thing was really aimed more at at Mark uh, uh, Collins, probably in the, in that um, uh, I, I, in in the question of what it is for a math pure mathematical claim to do explanatory work, but yeah, it's, it, so so okay okay good thank you. Okay, well, let's uh, open it up uh, to questions uh, for Steve. Now uh, we'll go to Mark first. Thanks, Steve, that was terrific talk. Um, so on that the issue you're just talking about, the, the what it is for a mathematical claim to be explanatory, I, I, I'm completely with you on this. I think that is a really important question and thus far, all I've ever done is wave my hands and say, intuitively, the mathematics is doing the heavy lifting or, or, or words to the, that effect. And that's, that's not enough. We need more than that. And what more to say is, is kind of hard. And I, I think things have stalled a little bit there. I, like, I really like your paper to talking about the, the, the grades of mathematical involvement in explanations. But one thing that I've been convinced of for a while is given that there are mathematical explanations within mathematics and that trying to understand what's going on there, because 
in some ways, maybe it's not less controversial, but it seems less controversial to me that there are genuine explanations within mathematics. And so to try and work out what's going on in there, where there's no confusion by empirical stuff coming in, sort of bleeding into the story, then if you can understand what the mathematical explanation is in pure mathematical terms, then maybe that will shed some light on what it would be to be a mathematical explanation elsewhere. Now, of course, a lot of nominalists don't like the idea of there being mathematical explanations in the empirical realm. And some at least bite the bullet and say, well, then there can't be mathematical explanations within mathematics because you don't want to buy them at all. Um, so maybe that doesn't advance the debate at all, but I'm just kind of curious about your thoughts of that particular um, approach to, to what we both agree on is an important question about what it is for something to be a, to be doing the heavy lifting in the explanation. Well, I just, um, um, I just want to agree that there certainly is a practice of regarding some mathematical facts as explanatory of others. And I enjoyed your paper with David Ripley and somebody else. I can't remember using Perl type causal models to try to make, make sense of that. Um, I guess what I'd have to, I guess what would really surprise me is if you couldn't understand that kind of thing in terms of deltified statements. I mean, it's because it's, it's, there's certain kind of grooves that math, certain kinds of mathematical objects sort of go down or, and, and the explanation is in terms of the grooves, not the objects going down them kind of. And so, uh, uh, But that isn't really, and I mean, mostly, I, I, I mean, you've done more to, you know, make sense of mathematical explanation. And, and of course, Mark Lang has done a great, a great deal. I, I kind of think one, one, one clue might be, like I, I mentioned, to try to figure out um, what mathematical coincidences are. And people have written about this. There's a great Wikipedia article with a bunch of mathematical coincidences. And what exactly is second rate about a mathematically coincidental fact, even though it's necessary, and it seems to have something to do with the explanatory structure of, of, of math, and the fact is coincidental if, you know, the reason that A, in explaining why A equals B, you have to explain why A is what it is, and then why B is what it is, and then you just notice that those are the same thing as opposed to there being a unitary explanation of why they would be the same thing, so to speak, whatever they turn out to be. And uh, that sort of seems, phenomenologically, that seems like it could be a way into these issues, but I agree with you that the whole thing is severely understudied, unless you've read Mark Lang's book, in which case, it's, in which case, you know a lot more than me. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, let's go to Isaac and then Mary. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, so, Stephen, I was wondering, I just had a quick question about the, the, the triangle operator. Um, so, uh, I was thinking that I thought generics usually involve like these quantificational elements in some way or another, and the examples that you were giving had something quantificational-ish about them, like the bishops or the males or something. Uh, but then I was wondering in the like triangle applied to seven is more summable than two. Yeah. I didn't really see any quantificational -ish element to that kind of a statement. Right, and good. I'm worried that it might, that the triangle applied to that statement might not be explanatory in the way you want if it lacks that quantificational element. So yeah, I was just wondering what, what you might say about yeah. that. No, that's a great point. So the usual sort of linguistic regimentation um, is to treat, to have a, a, a binary quantifier, gen X, FX. So, you know, dogs bark would be gen X, dog X. And then the matrix would be bark, bark X. So, um, the reason I didn't 
go, well, apart from time, the reason I didn't want to go into that so much is that um, that works for, so roughly it's this, I would have to say numbers, are, so I would be, I would be generalizing over numbers. Numbers are like this, you know, so gen X, number X, but it would have to be a plural generic quantifier because I have to say numbers are such as to contain a least even prime, oh, sorry, to contain a unique even, even prime. And the standard ways of reading the, the, the genericity uh, quantifier make it a non-plural quantifier, sort of a singular quantifier. I want to be, this would have to be a collective generic. So, you know, football teams are such as to have, uh, you know, a goalkeeper or something like that. And those, those kinds of things kind of just raise grammatical issues that I was trying to, to uh, avoid. But, you know, it would be something analogous to uh, chess, chess sets have four bishops. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's uh, go to Mary. Uh, thanks, Steve, for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm, as ever, tempted to um, uh, try and read the generic claim in the modal structural way, because I'm just a fan of modal structuralism. Now. So, so it, lo it looks to me like um, it's in the nature of numbers that there's a um, there's an even prime one. Um, it looks like that claim is very naturally thought of as saying, well, in any omega necessarily in any omega sequence, there's at least prime, there's an even prime. Right. So it looks like the, the modal structural model is just quite already providing quite a nice way of understanding those, that generic reading. And so that, that leads me to think, okay, well, when we try and understand how generics work in explanation, um, there's also a natural picture that we, could, we can pick up from that, which is the idea that when we um, uh, use a mathematical structure in an explanation, what, we, what we're doing is saying, well, this um, in a particular uh, physical system, this mathematical theory is explanatory to the extent that these objects do instantiate the mathematical structure that's been described in our axioms. So it looks like um, that generic picture fits quite well with the machinery that's already there in the, the modal structural account and also with a picture of, of explanation that goes with that account. So just interested in, in whether you see those parallels. No, I do see those parallels, and and I think I just need to think more about that. I mean, I guess one one thought would be that I mean, there's with some exceptions, exceptions, generics have more are more box-like than diamond-like, and I think that could be could be important in some applications when you're trying to sort of combine different sorts of mathematical facts. I mean, that's a very sketchy uh, thought because, I mean, I mean, there are some, you know, as Gabriel Luciano, you know, has argued, there, there are some mathematical theories that don't, that are each, individually possible, but, th 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 but that aren't say co-possible, um, mm -hmm. or I should maybe not completely mathematical theories. Like set theory isn't really compatible with universal muriology and that universal muriology suggests that the cardinality of the universe should be like a power of two, whereas set theory doesn't, doesn't allow that. And so that, that's, 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 that's one thing. I, I don't really know what the implications of that would, would be. But the, the other thing is this, the reason I like the kind-based approach better, and the way you put it maybe shows a way around this, is that I don't like the idea of linking the mathematical facts, the pure mathematical facts, too closely to any particular axiomatization. Mm -hmm. That those axioms are, are are justified by reference to what we think the relevant entity behaves like, and they're correctable 
yeah, mm -hmm. by reference to mm -hmm. perceived mismatches between someone misaxiomatized this, or you know, the the my favorite example of of this is uh, which you probably I mention it all the time. And I heard from Jamie Tappenden, like you know, you know, we start out thinking this isn't really misaxiomatization, but you you know, everybody knows the basic notion of a prime number is like a number that has no factors, you know, other than itself and one, but that turns out to be the wrong notion of a prime number if you're doing number theory in the complex plane, which is where it's supposed to be done because all kind, you know, five does have complex factors other than, uh, you know, it's two plus i times two minus i or something like that. So it turns out that the more revealing way of explaining what a prime number is, is it's what's usually taken to be a, a theorem. It's the number that if it divides a times b, then it either divides a or it divides b. And it seems to me these kinds of, this kind of fluidity and flexibility is really important and being tied too closely to what, to the axiomatization of the day is, mm -hmm. is could, could, could be too rigid, I don't know, yeah. Mm -hmm. But basically I'm sympathetic to what, to, to what you're, what you're saying. Those are just tiny reservations. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to use my uh, organizer privileges to call a five minute break. Um, uh, so let's plan to reconvene after five minutes and we'll open it up to uh, general discussion um, at uh, 11 minutes.